Danish, grew up in Ireland, which probably explains the sort of rather funky accent, and it changes a lot from time to time. Lived in France, lived in Germany, lived in the US. Um, and I guess I've always sort of been a, a confident child growing up, fairly high achiever, you know, very sporty, lots of friends, etc. But grew up in a, a privileged bubble that sounds like come from a very wealthy background. I, I don't, but I came from a very conservative family where you were taught to use good manners, be polite, get, develop good negotiation skills, you know, all the kind of life skills that we teach our kids every day. But nobody really mentioned much about what happens with violence and, you know, any detail about people that are predatory in nature and what that means. And so I think as a, as a teenager, that leaves you fairly ill-prepared when you, when you travel the world and, you know, you, you broaden your education and you come into situations where you do meet predatory types. And so, unfortunately, uh, in my case, when I was 18 and I was uh, au pairing in France, I went to a martial arts demo, funnily enough, I mean, there's so many ironies in this. And what happened at the, at the end of that evening was that a man, 42, raped me. I was 18. He had talked me into staying at his place to be safe, not to take a late trip home because there's been a lot of rapes on the metro, etc. You know, sort of set his perfect little trap. And uh, in the middle of the night, as I was uh, asleep, I suddenly woke up uh, as he was naked and like in my face, and things went rapidly downhill from there. I did actually do some really cool things. And you know, when, when Joe and I first started talking about what had, what had happened, it was like, I didn't know what to do, so I did nothing. But actually, when I was writing this talk, I actually did quite a lot. I apologized, I tried to negotiate, I tried to reason, I tried to point out the fact that I didn't particularly know what I was doing because I'd actually never slept with someone, which was almost like Christmas had come early, so it's probably exactly the wrong thing to say to somebody like that. So you're using all these tools, but it's like driving through Chicago with a map of LA. So, you know, you keep trying things, you end up one down one avenue, but it doesn't work, and you try something else. And you become more and more bewildered and more and more frustrated. And it's incredibly traumatizing. Um, so what, what happened after that was then, um, at some point, I must have passed out. Um, and the next day, it was, you know, sweetness and light. Sorry, I was really grumpy last night. And, uh, you know, tea was made. And, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I have to go see my mom. And, you know, I couldn't take it there because I never take girls there. And go see the market on your way home. It's really pretty and stuff. And I kind of half traumatized, walked out of there thinking, I don't know what the hell just happened, you know. Um, and I'd always brought up, been brought up, you know, like I said, in a very conservative way. So um, the fact was, you know, don't start anything you're not prepared to finish. So that pretty much had kept me <laughs> in my virginal state, I guess, until I was 18. It's too scared to kind of do anything. So wandering through the streets of Paris for, for hours and hours, eventually got on a train and just kind of lost it. And then this other man came up to me and said, oh, what's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, let me help you. Let me take, me take you to my flat for some coffee and we can talk about it. You know, no mention of calling the police or anything. But I mean, at that point, I just thought, Jesus, you know, the world is a really, really evil place. And, you know, obviously didn't fall for it, went home and then didn't really speak to, to anybody about it for, for quite a while because I couldn't really articulate it and I couldn't really understand it. And I couldn't really understand... Um, it didn't fit with my view of myself because my view of myself was that I was quite a capable individual, you know, um, I was quite able to reason with people, I uh, hadn't really been in that situation before and so I kind of think, well that must have been something that just really went drastically wrong, maybe it was a lack of cultural understanding, <laughs> maybe, you know, who knows, no idea. So um, I put that away in a dark place, I guess. Um, but what happened and what I couldn't understand was that much like the sort of limping gazelle at the end of the pack, it does impact your behavior. And people that would be predatory would be very good at picking up on them. So that sort of exacerbated the problem really. And different situations, different people, and I couldn't, I couldn't really make any links through what kept happening to me, you know, what was, you know, what was going wrong. I was being fairly careful with things. And uh, whenever things would go horribly wrong, it was usually a sort of a trick of the situation again. People saying, oh, I'll walk you home to make sure you're fine. Really situations where you wouldn't think that you would get into that situation, but, but something was clearly sending out some kind of signal. That's not a thing that that's a blame thing, but it's something that happens, and I think, I think it's fairly common as well. So I kept sort of going with my life. I sort of fairly dysfunctional relationship. I was fairly volatile <laughs> and excitable in my early 20s, I think, you know, very, very stressed. 
um, but still managed to, to get my university qualifications, had a really good career, had a lot of friends, you know, and nobody really noticed anything. The fact that I was acting kind of strangely from time to time, I think they just put down to the fact that I was foreign, <laughs> and that, you know, that was just to be expected, so, you know, nobody really had any benchmark for what Scandinavian people are like, you know, they all think they're some kind of mad sexaholic swinging out of the chandeliers most of the time, so they, you know, okay, you know, that's, that's just her, so we'll just kind of leave her to it. Um, so I had my, had my son, uh, he's going to be nine now, which is just about the best thing that happened. Uh, now I get to actually raise a man, so you know, it gives me a real insight, you know, not, not everybody's the same. But, but after that, it was, it was sort of a fairly traumatic time in my, in my private life, I guess, with my husband. And I started thinking, okay, well, something is not quite right here, you know, I need to do something. And, you know, the fact had been really, I wouldn't really do anything for myself, I didn't want to save myself, but I realized because I get getting sick, probably the amount of cortisol that was kind of racing through my veins was, you know, sky high. Um, so I kept getting pneumonias. I got about seven pneumonias within the space of 12 months. <laughs> Sudden onset, and then I would just have bilateral collapse. You know, any job. Um, and my consultant said, well, you know, we've tested you for everything under the sun. I remember in one session sitting and giving about 22 vials of blood, you know. I said, well, there's nothing wrong with you. Are you very stressed? And I was like, Possibly, you know. So I said, I really need to do something. So I rang the Red Crisis, uh, who are very sympathetic, uh, but said, You'll need to wait 12 months before you can see anyone. Um, so I waited 12 months, and then it was like it was quite stunning suddenly getting the phone call out of the blue going, What was that for me? And then I went and talked to the, the very nice people uh, for about three months uh, and tried to make the counselors feel better when they'd start crying. <laughs> so that again didn't, didn't really work terribly well. And so I came out after about three months and said, well, that's great. I've now heard myself articulate things that I had really not consciously associated with myself. So it's almost like having a dual identity like you know like Batman or Spider-Man or something except you know not in a very positive way um, and I thought I need to do something so I started googling uh, the website so, okay self-defense may be the way to go you know to do something to feel safer so I came across this jiu-jitsu Edinburgh jiu-jitsu club <laughs> so these people leaping over cars and I thought well that isn't gonna happen um, and I looked at a few other things and the things that really attracted me I think to, to Jerry's teaching methodology was that it talked a lot about the emotional impact of violence and the behavioral impact of violence, and that's something that I could relate to. The images of the people in the, the gear was uh, slightly off-putting, and um, I remember writing this really sheepish email to Jer uh, saying, um, I'm interested in taking the self-defense class. I'm not sure I would be able to join a class as such. Uh, pictures are a little bit scary, but uh, I managed to say that something had happened. And I think that's sort of almost like when the coaching relationship started because uh, his response by email was, you know, you've taken the first step, you know, keep going, you know. So that was really encouraging. That was sort of the first real sense of encouragement, if you like. Uh, and then we started to, to read two books. One was uh, The Gift of Fear by Gavin de Becker, which was illuminating. It was very difficult to read sometimes because there's some case studies and talks a lot about violence and it's quite visceral, you know, and you read it and you put it out and you pick it up. And, by the time I eventually got through it, I got it. I got predatory behavior. Uh, it was like kind of a big wave of negative energy just disappeared, which was fantastic. And the other book was by Ellen Snortland, who's now since become quite a good friend of mine, uh, Beauty Bites Beast. Um, when I first read it, again, I thought, God, this is really angry. Um, it challenged a lot of the social norms that we understand, the social things that you know, you'd been brought up with. Um, but again, I, I kind of realized that sort of our perception of our own ability to defend ourselves, you know, particularly as women, can actually be quite dangerous because particularly after the trauma that had happened, I just felt like, yeah, you might learn something, but can you really injure a man? It was kind of like Robocop, you know, that they're always going to be stronger, you know, they're always going to be able to defeat you, you know, if they really try. So kind of, you know, that, that was something we needed to work on. Um, so. In our first session, uh, we tried sort of an emotional climate drill, and I think you're probably sitting about the, the same distance, or maybe even a bit further away, and just said, right, so this is what we're going to do, I'm going to walk up towards you, give you a little bit of negative energy, and I was standing there, and kind of got a bit of a face on, clenched his fist, and I completely lost it, just in floods of tears. 
So he was like, right, we'll go do some paperwork. And so we sat down and filled in some forms, and I'm sure he was thinking, oh my God, you know, what, what are we going to do now? But uh, we talked a bit, and we, we started, and we, we found a way, I guess, you know. But it took about three months of, of working together, um, carefully sort of abstracting things out quite a lot. We did a lot of work with big bags and pads and things. And Jer was also quite generous with his time in terms of talking because as I started thinking more about this, there'd be a lot of questions, you know. There would be some emotional aspects as well, you know, when you're not used to contact sports, you know, you come home with bruises and you look at them and it, it triggers some very negative associations and you kind of have to put that back in a box. And every time I would pull up <laughs> outside uh, the gym that you saw there in the, in the basement of the church, I'd have to sit and steady myself in the car. I would physically feel ill, you know, but I would go and it wasn't, it was kind of sink or swim for me because if I didn't do it, <laughs> it was only going to go one way, you know, I probably wouldn't be here today. And, um, and I would, and every time I came out, Jer was really good at kind of empowering me, you know, asking the right questions, not just showing what he could do, but what I could do and, and finding different ways. And there were genuinely training days where my head was just in a very different space. It was probably quite difficult to reach. There were days where Jared had, had quite a stressful week, and, and I felt that it, it would be difficult, you know, to, to get there. But we did, and, and some fantastic successes as well. And then after about three months, I joined the, the group uh, that trained there regularly, uh, some of which you saw there, uh, and just started training with them. And that was a very positive experience because I, I, I got a lot of brothers, if you like. I got a lot of positive uh, relationships with men and I started learning from them but it was very difficult to relax into the drills and so when we talk about you know the, the you know the, the different attitudes I was always fighting <laughs> for the first six months I think you know and a lot of guys would you relax you know you're always fighting you know but I was I was always fighting and so that that took quite a while to calm down um I get very fixated maybe on specific scenarios and I don't uh, I think a lot of women that have been in these situations would really greatly benefit from taking a self-defense class. Um, you're not there to rewrite the past, but the point is I think that you can cope with the future and, and feel more comfortable. And so we started doing some courses with the Rape Prizes. We did some courses with the Dundee groups as well. And just at the end of last year, I did a class with uh, Willow where we worked with some ex, uh, street sex workers as well, with some of the guys in Edinburgh, and that was really, really positive. And you know, there's so many things that we really all have in, in common. And I think if you can sit down and talk about understanding violence, it doesn't really matter what background you're from, there's a lot that you can give back. So I do this sort of uh, as a passion, both for self-preservation, <laughs> but also really out of wanting to give something back and to help others. And you sort of start developing this need to train, this need to teach. And we get all the frustrations, I think, that all of you have by trying to normalize self-defense for people, getting people to take this up, realize it should be a life skill like swimming or literacy, you know. But there's still quite a lot of reluctance, you know. I think my mother is still quite shocked that I'm doing this. She's like, oh, you're going there with all the, the guys again, you know. The first thing she said when I said I'm taking a self-defense class was, what about your teeth? <laughs> <laughs> Still here. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of uh, misunderstanding about what it's all about. You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm going to start cage fighting or anything like that. And um, when you talk to, to people about it as well, particularly women, they often think that they're going to have to do, you know, 10 rounds with Tyson as opposed to just not being the slowest gazelle, really, at the end of the pack. So that's really what it's all about. I know there's kind of a, quite a lot in here, and I've probably said a lot, but. I would like to invite questions if you have them. Uh, you guys have any questions? For that? For me? For the yeah, there, was a, there was obviously a trigger wasn't there, when you first wrote that email. Yeah. I had a panic attack. Yeah, I had a panic attack. What were you thinking? I was in London in a, in a, in a hotel working. And I was walking down a, cap, uh, a corridor getting to my hotel room, and a guy was walking in the opposite direction past me. And then he probably realized he'd forgotten something in his hotel room. So he wasn't very far behind me when he did sort of an instant turnaround. <laughs> and I went, holy, you know, this could go seriously wrong. And I completely panicked. 
and I was trying to get my key, and I was trying to, to get it through the door, you know, I'm sure as I was fumbling and, you know, having a meltdown, he probably passed right by me and <laughs> made his way to the room, to his own room, but as soon as I got into my room, I just collapsed in a heap on the floor, and I thought, well, this is not normal, you know, like, this is not a way that you can live. Um, so that was it specifically when I picked up the phone, but I think also the fact that I was just getting so ill all the time, you know, wasn't going to resolve itself without doing something drastic. Yeah. Uh, some interesting things about the email. Uh, when I got the email, um, I must—I was just about—I was just starting out, really. I'd, I'd been to Montreal. I met Tony and done the training with him. Did a bit of reading and stuff. Uh, and I've been running the gym for a while. And uh, but I must have been in a, quite an abundance mindset because I went, look, if I never see you at a training course, I want you to do these two things. Get these two books and read them, and then, and then that'll be a good thing for you. And then see then if you want to come training, because I knew the books were very pro training, and, and that that if if they would help you to get to that point, then we would be really rolling. But uh, rather than try and sell your training course, you know what I mean. Yeah. So that that's kind of interesting thing as I look back at it. And the other thing that just struck me as as and that's I gave her a talk is 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 that thing you said at the end is that. How many times did we say it? It's not about what happened in the past. It's about what we're going to help you to do in a couple of weeks' time. And, and, and in fact, I, and you may have touched on it, was that, that I never asked her what had happened. And we never, we never actually went into it. And you know, those of you who come across some ideas about therapy and so on like that, a lot of the therapy, you know, they, go, they go right. You know, tell me why. And if you did that with the women's aid and the groups and things like that, they would sit you down and have you replay. <coughs> yeah, it was, it was fairly, it was fairly free flowing, if if you like. Um, so not so prescriptive, but yeah, they, they, they can do that. I suppose if you go into more formal therapy, then they'll kind of go through it. And I think it just kind of re-traumatizes. Yeah, you said you said to me quite a few times that the the, um, the counselors would end up crying, right? Yeah. So you know what I mean. <laughs> so it's like, so anyway, we didn't go there. It was all about how we can help you walk out the door in an hour's time and feel safer. You know, so so that's an important, that was an important component of this. Yeah. At the same time, there's some important things about professional boundaries, I think, as well. Yeah. Is that at times working on a on a on a training um, um, together like that, you you need to just make sure you know what the boundaries are and and who's what you're doing and what you're not doing. And then you, you've got to make sure your training knows where she's headed and where that's not going as well and so, so on like that. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of keeping the goal in mind and not letting yourself go all over the map. You see, I'm, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not, you know, I'm, not also, I'm not a doctor. I'm not all sorts of things. But I do know, and I've got 26 drills mm -hmm. that I do know that take somebody from A to, to somewhere later than A. <laughs> in terms of self-defense, self-protection. So I, I knew that, and that, that's what you, you got to keep that thing rolling on. I think, I think that's the whole thing, and, and in the end it offers choice, you know, as opposed to no choice. So you might choose to do something, or you might choose to do nothing, it depends entirely on the scenario, but at least you feel like your control is a tactical thing, you know, so it's not, it's not a victim thing. Mm. The other thing as well that struck me, particularly when we're working with some of the rape crisis, is that some people are in a very bad emotional state, so I think as a coach, should also probably be reasonably careful, you know, whether you're working alone with someone who might be suffering from transference or, or whatever. I mean, we spend, spend a long hours, I guess, you know, I can see you and you're fairly intuitive with me as well, but I think, you, you know, you just need to, to keep your eyes open, you know, so that you get, don't get yourself into to trouble, maybe do a, a bigger group or have another coach there, or whatever you need to do. I think that's probably also something to be aware of. And there will be some women that will come to, to one class and they might not come back again and it doesn't mean that you've failed it probably means it's triggered quite a lot for them and quite a lot of other things in their life that they need to sort out that was some of the feedback that we got from some of the women in the rape crisis that would that would come and so it was beneficial to them in other ways they would have these light bulb moments and the feedback from some of the counselors i know there was that they made massive changes in their lives massive positive changes you know we felt pretty disappointed because we didn't see them back in the class and we wanted them to to learn things but i think everybody changes and kind of overcomes trauma at their own pace, so I don't think you know we should feel bad about that. It still creates kind of a, a ripple effect as well. 
Um, you know, and you all know the stats, you all know that you're probably quite likely to, to have, if you do a women's class or have women in the class, come across some people that have been through trauma or have been assaulted as well. So that's really important to know. And Simon, you were talking about, you know, the, the declaration form, you know, even confidentiality and, and asking the question, you know, in, in the appropriate way so that you don't do uh, a maneuver or something that's then going to trigger something and then, you know, it's, it's kind of going to have to be traumatized as well. So I think it's probably a question that most women wouldn't be upset at, at answering in a, in a questionnaire, you know, if it's confidential, you know, you know, you can keep what, this. What question would you say? I would say, have you experienced physical violence? I wouldn't necessarily go into what it, what it is, per se, because it doesn't really matter. And that's, that's the other thing. So, you know, you might, might in your head think, you know, did X, Y, and Z happen? It, it doesn't really matter because I think if people feel violated, they feel violated regardless, and, and, and that's the point. So I would just ask if they've if experienced violence, and then at least you would know whether it was theoretical or just a, a fear. Or you could even say if they felt threatened. So a lot of people haven't necessarily experienced direct violence, but you know they might have felt threatened in different situations. You know, for most women, you know, 100% would probably answer yes at some point. I wouldn't ask the question outright in the group. I've been to one training seminar, I won't say where, but um, where the, the instructor did ask, you know, a group of, has anybody been assaulted? And you're sitting there in a room full of people that you don't know. You know, people are not necessarily going to stick up their hands, you know, so, so I wouldn't do it like that. You know, you just obviously need to be sensitive to what you're asking people. And also take people's ability to, to cope with things, you know, be, be able to chop and change the routines that you're doing. So if one thing is causing a, a problem or a block, then, then change it up, you know, do something different. Uh, I mean, you know, you're pretty good at extrapolating things out. You know, have fun, do jokes, you know, you're not without humor just because you've been assaulted. So, you know, I'm not saying have a joke about that, but, you know, keep things light, you know, keep things fun as well, because people do learn better, you know, when they're having fun as well. And then that way it just becomes a much more positive experience.